I spoke earlier of approximately 200 million people or 5% of the adult population of the world using illicit drugs, if you just consider cannabis in this 5%, cannabis accounts for 4 of the 5%. So there's a way in which the system has to hold on to cannabis to um, give itself um, bulk, uh, if you like, as, a, as an issue. Um, it is hard to prohibit a plant that grows almost anywhere. I think New Zealanders know a good deal about that. Um, the arrest rates are high, and the interesting and puzzling thing is that, in fact, despite efforts at um, reducing penalties and so forth, in many of the developed countries, the uh, arrest rates have doubled in the, in, the, in, the, in the last 10 years. At heart, the debate is still very much driven by um, some hysteria, by op political opposition, but also I think the question around methamphetamine makes it extremely difficult for us to get any traction in terms of cannabis law reform in particular, but the uh, rational discussion about drugs in general. Because in this country there's such a huge passion about meth, about pee, um, that any drug discussion is automatically linked to a pee discussion, which then takes it out of the realm of being able to as assess proper harms and deal with the issues um, as they need to be dealt with. While there will be different views about um, cannabis, um, from a police perspective, for those that attempt to diminish the impact of cannabis on our community, I'd just like to provide a quick overview of our uh, last operation uh, in 2007. Uh, and also, I think, uh, neatly illustrates the intertwined nature of drugs, uh, money, supply and demand. Over 124,000 plants were uh, destroyed, 780 offenders arrested, 147 firearms seized, over $439,000 in stolen property recovered, 260 kilo, 16, sorry, kilograms of dried cannabis plant material destroyed, and nine uh, methamphetamine labs discovered and dismantled. This, quite, this conversation for me that you either have to be abstinent or you're going to end up abusive, abusing drugs, misses the fact that the majority of the people can have a healthy relationship with drugs. But one of the consequences of prohibition is that we don't instruct people how to do it. You know, as a parent, I had to deal with my son wanting to use marijuana. I didn't tell him that he could never use marijuana because he had seen me use marijuana. What I said is that I want you to wait as long as you can until you're closer to being an adult so that you can use it as opposed to having it using you. And that when you do it, I want you to do it here in my house. I want to see you and your friends when you're smoking. I talked to his parents about recognizing the signs of, of healthy drug use versus unhealthy drug use. If you have a group of kids sitting around together, passing around a joint and listening to music and talking, that is not the same as if you have them sitting in their room by themselves, smoking for hours at a time, not interacting with anybody. But we don't have permission to have those kinds of conversations among ourselves or with our kids. Because in the prohibitionist world, the only thing you're supposed to do to be responsible is say no. Under the control system as we have it, cannabis is controlled with the same degree of severity as heroin and cocaine. Um, is it as dangerous as heroin and cocaine? This is where evidence falls out of the window and ideology comes in because nobody can quite make up their mind about how to answer this question. Although under the Misuse of Drugs Act, you can technically get access to a form of medicinal cannabis. Now, it's a ministerial decision, it's a political decision. Um, we, in practice, it's virtually impossible. There has been no successful applications. Um, and it is very difficult to make an application. And in, when I had someone go and investigate it for me, um, they rang around the ministries to find out how you do it. Ministry of Health said, we will pro process an application if you can get a guarantee from customs that they would allow you to import it because there's nothing in the law that allows you to grow it and supply it here. You have to import a product um, from overseas. Customs then said, we will give you a license to import it if you can get a guarantee from the Ministry of Health that you will be able to use it. So just there, in this that one 
couple of phone calls. You have a bureaucratic administrative block that prevents you being able to access the law which provides for um, medicinal use under some circumstances. There hasn't been a lot of conversation about the fact that the global youth movement um, of the 60s was very much linked to cannabis use and that the attempt of, of various governments, particularly Western governments, the United States, the UK, France, et cetera, to suppress those movements was very much linked to the suppression of the drugs that people were using that were seen as a fuel to this um, counterculture sort of anti-establishment attitude. Um, given that cannabis still remains the number one illegal drug that people continue to use around the globe, it seems to me very significant that 30, 40 years later, in spite of the fact that so many people use it, that we still have this strong stricture against it. I wonder how much of that is related to the threat that it poses to the overall economic status quo if you allow or sanction its use, number one. And number two, what does it mean for justice systems that across the globe you have a good percentage of the people who were regularly actively flouting the law without any real um, fear of consequences? The evidence tells us that a large proportion of the community actually are supportive of change. In Western Australia, the, at the uh, drug summit, 72% of the, of the members of the drug summit voted that they wanted to have de uh, uh, decriminalization or prohibition with civil penalties. They wanted to make sure that it was a treatment and health response as opposed to a criminal response. Funnily enough, um, a survey um, conducted by the National Drug Research Institute found that 72% of the West Australian community supported the change. And magically, the Drug and Alcohol Office, which also conducted a separate um, um, investigation, found that 72% of the population supported um, a similar change. It was a magical figure. It was 72 every single time. Simple possession should be treated as a misdemeanor which attracts only minor penalty. And you can start to argue about the minor penalties, whether it should be fine, diversion, expiation, or warning. I would argue it should be the cheapest thing on the market you can possibly do, because you're not going to stop this stuff. And we've already shown that if you put people in prison, you don't stop it. So this isn't going to prevent any cannabis use. It's a warning, a signal that cannabis remains illegal and is frowned upon by the society, while at the same time not criminalizing, demonizing the, the user. Cannabis does indeed have its dangers. They can't be underestimated. The nature of the drug and what is available is changing over time. It's become a lot more potent in some cases. But by and large, all the evidence, at least at the level of empirical evidence and common sense, will tell you that cannabis is probably less dangerous than cocaine and heroin. That does not mean it's harmless, but it's probably less dangerous. If it is less dangerous, is our control system going to be better if we find a different way to deal with it or not?